thank you for having me. I'm going to present a work that is uh, done jointly with Professor Heckman and that is mainly wants to see what is the state of the literature regarding the uh, economics of human development in a broader sense. What I'm going to present today is in particular the part where we analyze the studies on the role of income on child development and uh, related to that the studies on credit constraints. Um, as we have seen, and we have seen in some of the talk, especially the one from Professor Lochner before, there seemed to be a strong correlation between uh, child outcomes and family income. However, there is a less clear, less evident role if income plays really a causal role of it's rather more uh, a proxy for some correlated family factor, which could be parental ability, education, or factors that we cannot directly control for, um, which influence both permanent income and child development. In the second aspect that is important to um, analyze, uh, I think, as, as social scientists or economists, would be to distinguish what type, especially not only as a, from a scientific point of view, but also if we think about policy implication, what type of income uh, affects child development most, and um, distinguish between what can be considered a poor income effect from what can be um, a combination of a wealth effect and a substitution effect, either in the price of some investment goods such as a tuition subsidy or in the price of time, for example, if we think about certain policy that affect uh, labor supply decisions, for example. So this is reviewing slightly different formats, some um, evidence that has been uh, accumulated over the years, similar to what was being shown before. If one just plot uh, a score in this case of like uh, antisocial behavior, uh, according to uh, family incomes quartile, one see a big effect where uh, the highest income quartile having the lower score, so the most positive outcome. But once uh, one a person control for maternal education and AFUT, in this case, those differences are much less uh, evident. The same we were seeing before. And um, if uh, one look at measures of cognitive scores, in this case, as a function of maternal education, uh, uh, see one sees the same pattern that indeed some variable that we think affect income but um, also affect um, cognitive scores of the children as well as the stability of those measures over the years but it's something that was emphasized before so I don't emphasize this more. Uh, I'll try to put this in a framework where I look both uh, from the problem of the parents uh, as well as from what is the technology that produces the skill of the children. So I try to combine the two and then to analyze um, the different aspects uh, separately. So the, many of you might be familiar, but we think about the technology of skill formation where potentially a vector of skill in the future period is produced by a technology which might be time varying um, from the previous set of skills, some investments which could be, in this case is a single vector, but we could also think about family investment as well as social investment, for example, and separate them out, as well as uh, some measure of uh, parental skills. It's, it's, it's definitely one could extend this technology, including uh, social peer effects, for example, of ad or other inputs. I would say this one is probably the uh, most estimated as well as estimable version given the, the data that we have. Um, the, the function is a uh, standard properties. The important aspect is that uh, while uh, this is usually being uh, estimated as a technology whose dimension of those vectors is fixed over time, one might think at an extension where the dimension itself of the skills increases over time. This introduces a new set of problems where the children pr uh, develops new ability growing and how previous ability could contribute in uh, growing in, in, in producing this new uh, set of abilities. And obviously it's very general in the sense that whatever is affected by those thetas might not only be like productivity on the labor market but might be as well uh, preferences of the children for example or uh, an old bunch of behaviors could be potentially accommodated in that framework because if one has some thetas that think uh, influence child preferences then, then this technology would be also uh, influencing the formation of preferences over time. The characteristic properties that are um, co coming out of from the empirical estimates of this technology, um, whenever nonlinear, are first the complementarity, especially in later periods between current skills and investment. So more skilled children tend to profit more from the same level of investment compared to less skilled children. 
However, this complementarity seems to increase over time and in particular to be very small, if not even uh, negative. So basically, if uh, skills and, uh, and uh, current skills and investment being substituted between them in the earlier periods. This is very important because the uh, consequence of these, um, the combination of the two is what determines the uh, efficiency implications in terms of what a planner might want to do. Uh, in terms of allocating investment across a uh, period of the, of the life um, of the child. And uh, uh, I don't know the aggregation to whether, but is that something we know or is it coming from the model? No, the model you could assume that this cross partial could be either positive or negative in any given period. What the estimates tend to show is that complementarity increases over time. The estimates are very close to substitute. I, there are, there, I never found an estimate from the few that are available from nonlinear technology where you can, uh, with like st certain statistical confidence, say that is indeed uh, substitutable at very early stage. But in order to get, let me preview a like, result that comes out of that, and uh, we went through a long derivation of, that actually proves the fact is that you just need these increase technology and the concavity of the technology function, there's increased complementarity in the, in the concavity of the technology function um, to, sh to show that even for a planner that is a, as a bentamide welfare function, so just want to maximize the sum of the human capital across a number of people, it would be profitable to invest more in the disadvantaged children in the earlier period uh, and then to disequalize investment after. So you just need these, you don't really need substitutability. The, the children will never be fully equalized at the end. The, the, the child that starts, if you think about two children, the child that starts with a higher initial condition will end up with a higher final level of human capital. But the amount of investment in the, in the first period or like in the initial periods uh, is, is higher in the, basically there is a, an efficiency reason for equalizing initially the children's because it's cheaper after to basically allocate investments. And you can prove this just from increasing complementarities over time, even just with two periods and, and concavity in the production function. The second aspect is that from the com static complementarity between skills and, uh, and um, investment and from the fact uh, that uh, the standard things that investment increase in, uh, uh, that the skills increase in investments, one get this uh, concept of dynamic complementarity that is very often considered like somehow of a separate concept. What, what really this comes from is simply from the fact that by investing today, I increase skills tomorrow. This uh, has an indirect or indirect effect over skills over all future period. And therefore, this makes investment in all future period more productive. So because investment today produce skills tomorrow and those increase productivity of future investment. Sorry? Sorry? This is a theory. Uh, this, comes, this comes straightforwardly from the assumption that if there, is if there is complementarity between skill and investment and skills are increasing in investment, you'll get uh, that, um, that this hold. So it's basically a consequence of the complement. It's not like a new finding or something that empirically, it's, it comes straightforwardly from the, uh, from the complementarity in later ages between skills and investments. The, what we uh, try to do in, in terms of comparing the literature is put these uh, estimates of the technology together with a decision problem for the parents and then see how different aspects affect the optimal amount of investment that the parents uh, do. Because so far those investments are exogenous somehow to the technology. What we want to do is um, internalize them uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a decision process of the family. So I try to do maybe in a, a slightly different way, but an exercise that is a little similar to what was done before of like looking at different components and see how these uh, affect. I just use one equation, I'm less sophisticated, which is the first order condition for any, uh, a problem over t periods of the parent. The value function of the parent is of a function of time, uh, just because it's a, it's a finite uh, horizon problem. Uh, uh, it depends on his uh, parental human capital, which I'm indexing over T, but one might also think is fixed for simplicity. The current level of skill for, of the child, which in case of theta zero, we could think about like some genetic endowment or initial condition. In all other period, would be what have been produced before, so it's a state for the parents. The current amount of wealth and the current um, uh, level of income, basically. This is just a shock determining the level of income. If one has a uh, maximize uh, the this discounted sum of utility 
end um, uh, of uh, child human capital, what um, the first order condition that comes out uh, for investment is the following. Uh, what you see, well, let's forget for a moment about the expectation, we go back to it, but there is a component which is simply the marginal product of investment in producing skills in the next period, and as you see, these could potentially depend on parental uh, abilities. So parents with different abilities could have different shell productivities in, uh, in the, um, uh, for the investment that they do. The, this is just a derivative of the value function with respect to the skills of the child, uh, which is basically just the marginal value of theta for the parents. And this is a so this is like the marginal benefit of investment, which is equated to the marginal cost. Well, I don't put the money in the bank. The price could be one, it doesn't matter, unless there is heterogeneity, but let's forget about that. Um, and what we have here is simply the marginal utility of wealth. So if I, I could either spend the money of investment or keep it in the bank and use it in a future period for either future investment or future consumption. And what I have here is a multiplier that makes these equate even in case when I cannot achieve uh, the, opti the potentially optimal amount of investment in case um, there are borrowing constraints. Those borrowing constraints can simply come out a little bit like related to the question I asked before, to the fact that this is um, a finite horizon problem, so there is an implied natural borrowing limit, which is given by what if I expect to receive the minimum income from now on. I cannot borrow more than an expected uh, flow of income because I will need to repay uh, with probability one uh, my, my, the amount of borrow, or could be stricter than that if we think that there are uh, restrictions to credit markets. As you see, there, and, and the last point which I was forgetting in the beginning is what is the, this expectation taking over? So like an information set which could be, again, heterogeneous technologies or could be other form of uncertainty. Um, yes? So the multiplier comes out, that's a multiplier, in the infinite horizon case that's coming off, uh, why, isn't, why would you get an added multiplier in the case with the infinite horizon case with no borrowing constraints? Just there's no, in the infinite horizon case, you get, um, you st in the infinite horizon case, you basically get the, like a Nyagari result type. In the finite horizon no, case, no, no, it's, it's a multiplier for borrowing constraints, but those are per period borrowing constraints. Yes, so but this is multiplier positive, right? Yes, and it's the same type of borrowing constraint that was considered in the previous. Paper. Yes, you cannot, yes, it's a, like a Bewley economy where you cannot borrow more and it's in finite horizon. So of course if you put the infinite horizon case you have more of a, of a, like you cannot die with positive wealth, like that type of condition basically. Like a transverse, you have a transverse, instead of adding like a, instead of having a natural borrowing limit, you're more of a transversality condition that you cannot die with that. So what you usually do in that case, you don't explicitly put a multiplier, just solve the problem assuming that the transversality condition holds, and then look at if the equilibrium allocation satisfies the transversality condition. You might have multiple equilibrium allocation, some of which do not satisfy transversality condition. In the case of a finite horizon, uh, you get it straightforwardly from just the sum of the discounted uh, uh, minimum, one over one plus r times the minimum amount of, uh, uh, of uh, income that you can get at every period so, summed uh, over the whole period. Okay. That multiplier is coming from the within period borrowing. Borrowing constraints, constraints. Yeah. yeah. And it's, and it's, 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 it's potentially time varying. The important thing is that, uh, I'll, I'll say it in the next slide, but let's, let's, let's go through these. Like, the, the, the first point is that to go from left to right. Each one of these elements could be potentially affected by interventions or uh, could be heterogeneous across families. So the information set could, depend, could be heterogeneous across family and we might think at least we have some evidence from some interventions such as uh, nerd family partnership, uh, partnership for example, that can or like the research, well Flavio doesn't really does an intervention but at least shows us that the IT could be different across families. So potentially we could think that this is something that could be targeted by some policies. The productivity itself if we think that we could change, for example, theta p somehow, or we, that we could complement these, um, uh, these functions with some social investments, uh, then we could potentially change the, this uh, element. The preferences, well, I don't know if this can change, but definitely this can be heterogeneous across different people in the population. And the borrowing constraints certainly can be re if relaxed. If it's heterogeneous across people, how can you, how can you distinguish between dynamic complementarities and just heterogeneous profiles? Sounds like maybe I'm just missing something. I mean, uh, if, if 
different families have different F, then it's sounds incredibly hard to know if you're just picking up different profiles uh, or if you're... If well, it depends, it depends if you can estimate the time series for the... the Right. Yeah, for the enters, right? It depends on how the edit well, enters. Basically. I thought F yeah. was a function of T. If it's constant, yeah. it's but it could just still be separable in something like, like logs, for example. Okay. Like a, a family shots that can be relative efficiency differences among firms, among families. Yeah. yeah. I see. But you can't change F by investing. Well, it depends of what we think theta p is, right? If you think that the parents can invest in, in himself, like so that there is another uh, first order condition for like his own human capital, for example, then you might think that you can change f because theta p is indeed theta tp, right? So in this case, you might think I might become more skilled. It's a little bit like, or I, sh I don't know, from the second child, I might theta p in this should be higher. Something like what we were saying before. Um, the, the point of all this is simply that there is no reason to focus specifically on one of these elements. In the end, is a is an empirical uh, question, I think, to compare the magnitude uh, and to do this is an, in a hopefully comparable way between different, for example, social intervention that targets <coughs> different aspects of this equation. All affect the level of investment that is that uh, that is um, that is this decided upon by the parents. There is no reason a priori to prefer an intervention that targets like social investment directly from one that target reducing borrowing constraint from one that want to increase information or parental altruism. It depends ultimately from like a cost benefit case for which one of these interventions seems more effective provided that we think that we have a social welfare function when we want higher human capital for the ch a child. And the second aspect, which is a little bit embedded in these, you can think uh, very obviously just from the first order condition for savings, that this VST plus one is really the expected value of the same term for VST plus two, et cetera, et cetera, plus all future multipliers. So you don't necessarily need the multiplier to, like if there are credit constraints at any period, you don't need that they bind today to basically reduce the amount of investment compared to the optimal one that you would have. And this is basically like, that's actually the way I started thinking about this problem is if we think about the standard consumption over the life cycle problem, like mm, uh, precautionary savings emerge from the fact that people are not necessarily constrained, but they want to save in order to edge possible constraints in the future coming from like shocks to income. And if we think that like those models are usually there, there's a consumption good, which is C, whatever. But if we think that kids are like a durable consumption good, then why not? There should be a trade off between uh, saving for uh, like future um, edging purposes and the amount of money you put in your own consumption but as well as investing in, in children. The point is, again, as I was saying before, do these matter a lot, a little bit for, for whom they matter? I think that's ultimately is the purpose of empirical analysis to, to disentangle the, the whole effects. And, um, and the other fact is that was uh, emphasized before as well that Dynamic complementarity potentially interacts with credit constraints because constraints in the early years could be especially harmful if we think that the early human capital determines the productivity of future investments uh, overall uh, the peri period of development. So what, what I want to look now is at the literature between, um, let's say, late and early constraints. So first looking at constraints that um, act more or less at the college entry level and then at some papers that had looked more at constraints um, at uh, earlier a um, ages. Obviously, the literature of, of constraint is strictly related with the literature that try to find an effect of income, because if we think that, forget for a moment about the wealth effect over the, the whole life, if we think that there is an effect of income on a given period, of the timing of income on a period, the way to rationalize that, unless we think like that this is so big that really changes the whole permanent income, is because actually the family wasn't able to transfer resources from the future. Uh, to the present uh, period. So the, the evidence on credit constraints in college, I think, and again, also here I made some statements uh, with uh, caveats. I think that's what emerged from our reading of the literature, but uh, um, I'll, try to, I'll try to be fair uh, to the literature. I think there is little evidence of, the, of, of like Im very important credit constraints as affecting college enrollment. 
I think that there is there are di there are different ways of testing this thing. Is there a pointer here? Yeah, like this this paper, like Keenan Wolpe in two thousand and one, as well as Cameron and Tabor, are a type of paper that try somehow in different ways, like more structural way or more. Well, it's also structural, this one, but really to get an estimate of the actual credit constraints. Whereas this paper and the more updated studies by, for example, Professor Lochner that we will see is more looking at the distributional uh, effect of college enrollment by, by family income. How, how would you empirically distinguish, but, I mean, if it's really about expectation about future constraints? So you, on the last slide you said that it's enough to have expectations about future constraints, yeah. possibly binding. Well, well, what they do, like in Keenan Malkin, you have a... distinguish between that versus someone served or some other information problem? I mean, it seems oh. incredibly hard once you allow for that. Oh, I know, I agree with you. I mean, it's, it's extremely hard in a structural model to have even the data or the capacity to identify all of them. Okay. Like, my problem with, uh, for example, to just take two points, the information and the heterogeneous technology, my problem with... Uh, uh, problem. I mean, my concern uh, with uh, Cunha's work is that it's very hard to distinguish correct belief on heterogeneous technology from wrong belief uh, to an of an homogeneous technology. Well, can you think of data, anything in data that allows you to do Well, in that case, for example, he has measures of belief. If he, as he, uh, like his, his hope is, keeps following these uh, mothers, then he could estimate technologies and actually, even if the sample is not too big, hopefully estimates if there is indeed heterogeneity and maybe the mothers were actually right. I mean, maybe they were assuming that they're Productivity was lower than average, and maybe they are lower than average once you get the estimates of the actual of the actual productivity. What they do here is this is exactly what I was talking about, though, in, in a sense that if you if, if you're willing to sort of say information doesn't move one you know immediately when you give someone an extra couple thousand dollars, then you can imagine looking for data experiments where families got extra money and. If it's an information story, it shouldn't matter. If it's a constraint story, it should. Right. Yeah. Um, so that's. A, and and we do have some data, like in yeah. the nurse family partnership, we give information. Exactly. Yeah, then we you look at information type stories. Exactly. Well. Yeah. Right. Exactly. exactly. And we, we actually do. I, I don't review. There are some tables, by the way, I forgot to say, that comes from our paper that were on the back. And there we, there, like, we go through all the stories. I just picked some. Uh, here, some because like the author is potentially in the audience, so there could be a dialogue, some other. And, and what you see there is that sometimes it's hard because those interventions, obviously, I mean, people put social policy, they do a lot of things. So very often it seems like an income program, but then you find out if you really dig into the documentation that they're also subsidizing uh, some form of intervention, like childcare, or the mother needs to go to a center to, mm, I don't know, get, be enrolled if it's unemployed in order to search for work. And one might start thinking, oh, maybe she also speak with other mothers in that center. It does this have an effect on information as well. You should take a look at a paper by Nick Turner and uh, Dave Manoli looking at uh, the kink or at the top of the ATC schedule. Um, they argue, I mean, the evidence is pretty noisy, but they try to do an RK design at the top of the ATC schedule and argue that additional EATC causes child enrollment for uh, EATC payments to families when their kids are 18 years old. So it would be kind of direct evidence if you believe in the RKs. RKs are really tough to do, right? But uh, if you believe the evidence, it would kind of it would suggest actually incredibly large uh, credit constraints for that yeah, particular yeah. subset. And it's similar to the study that also uh, Professor Lochner has done on the same ATC. And there are yeah, others. Exactly. I'm, I'm, you're I'm, saying I'm, the estimates are incredibly large? Yeah, incredibly it seems large. very large. Yeah, for probably too large. Yeah, okay. but, uh, <laughs> where, where's the paper? The the fact is I'll, I'll make a caveat on these. I mean, what does it mean that we find large credit constraint? Who can be constrained? And, uh, and, uh, and, and what does this mean in terms of like, uh, policy implication? But I'll, I mean, I'm not surprised that we can find that there are people that are constrained. I mean, it's th the point is that how much does this matter? And, and, and does it go in the direction where we think it should go? Uh, it, it's just let me, let me I'll, I'll come back to this point at the very end. But it's no, 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 I'll definitely, I, I, I didn't know. I, I should definitely play, check it out. The, oh, sorry. The, the, what, what seems to appear here is that, especially in the studies that look at um, ability, once ability is controlled for, the effect of income seems to uh, become at least smaller, if not disappear. But there is some evidence that tries to look at a different, like more of a time series of, these, of this question, which is uh, some work Professor Lochner and other co-authors, which is, um, is the role of income become stronger over time? And here is a, a picture from Benley and Lochner in 2007. This is actually means Lochner using NLSY in 97, Lochner using NLSY 1979. Um, and uh, what you see here, I just uh, superimposed the two graphs. 
the first one, the more solid, let's say, the, is the one on using NLSY 79, and the shaded uh, bars are the ones using NLSY 97. And uh, those are quartiles of income, uh, of, of ability, sorry, and those bars are quartiles of income. So what you see in this picture is first that clearly there is almost an, a general increase in college attendance um, across all the distribution of income and ability between the two periods, which is not surprising, and so it's what we know from many studies. And what you noticed is also that it seems that the, if you look at the income gradient, it has become much steeper uh, at the lower quartiles of ability than it was before. Here basically there is no income gradient, here minor, but it becomes much steeper, whereas it has remained very similar at the highest um, uh, quartile of ability. What we, what we see is, therefore, the general increase, the increase is highest for less able children with richer parents, and the question then becomes, what do we make of it? Is it really evidence of a greater role of income as income having a greater causal effect, or is income um, telling us something else? What happened to the price of college? The, the price of college? It's, it's increased it's over this period a lot, but, but the, the Well, it depends on the ability of the child and the income. True. It's, it's also increased true. a lot. Yeah, less the as if you think about the situation, situation. Yeah. 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 This I mean, is substantially in, 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 Yeah. I mean, it, this predates a lot of the, the merit stuff that went crazy more than, I think that's, this, it's kind of a little bit later than this, although it's sort of starting, I think, this link cohort. But certainly poor people pay a lot lower price. I mean, so a different, uh, one, one interpretation is that these gaps really, that, that it's so steep is kind of undo, you know, it's, it should probably be even steeper if everybody paid the same price. I mean, poor kids are, pay, are getting paid to go, and they're still not going. Well, still not going. That's the point. Yeah. The rich kids. There's no cost per se in terms of financial. Yeah. Yeah. One one other point is that there is an overall change, and as we all know from the debates in the income distribution, and if we think that education is for the parents and, and income elastic married goods, and the changes in income are concentrated in the right tail then you might expect directly, just from a normal good argument, children of richer parents to go more uh, than children from poorer families. Uh, the second aspect is that is related with that is that indeed what we observe from, for example, Keenan Wolpe in 2001 or Johnson, it seems that there are huge heterogeneity in the parental transfer that are made to the children according to uh, basically measures of income of the parents. So the richer the parents, the higher the parental transfers, and that for example, in Keenan Wolpe in 2001, time parental transfer seems to explain a part of the uh, effect of parental income on um, intergenerational correlation of education, for example. And, um, and what we, what the, the combination of the two is that it is not clear how much of an efficiency problem there is in, these, uh, in seeing this income gradient. Because we know that from other studies, some studies I, I also worked on, that for low ability students, the real return to college once costs are taken into account are very low, if not even negative. Um, so it is not clear if a planner that was uh, outcome is to maximize like uh, output in society, for example, would have an efficiency reason to necessarily increase college attendance for the less able. Obviously, if the parent is willing to provide a high parental transfer because he as a parent or she as a parent gets a utility from the child, ch child going to school, uh, and to college because he's good with his peers, then he's willing to basically subsidize four years of fun and requiring very little effort, of course, who wouldn't go. But it, it doesn't necessarily make a, an inefficiency uh, due to, those, uh, to this effect. Yeah. So, so what would have changed, why do you think that would have changed? So, so the problem, I, 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 I never, in our stuff, I was always, I think I try to be very careful to say that a gradient doesn't imply borrowing constraints because one can come up with a number of stories for that, including sort of the <laughs> consumption die story. Um, but I, what we, I think we emphasized more was that this gradient got quite a bit steeper, and that I think is much harder to reconcile with a consumption story for the reasons we talk about a little bit in the paper, which is rich people should respond less to the big increase in the returns because that's of less value to them, and poor parents should respond much more to the big increase in the returns to college. No, but the, the, like going back to your paper, for example, you have these um, like polynomial regression, which is kind of a 
version of these graphs, just with a like nonlinear, where you show that indeed, like if you plot college attendance and income, it goes up and it's kind of parallel on the between 97 and 79, relatively uh, the same. Like you see, but is the intercept changes, so you you observe. Well, the one's more. very flat at the bottom, and then yeah. it starts coming but, up after the median. But the it, fact on that graph is like that. I I I think. Like when I was thinking in my mind, it's like when they're in finance, they put the volume right at the bottom. Like you would want to see like how many people are in that part of the distribution and how much income they get. Because if you get a very, a very, a very, oh, sorry, a very big change in the right tail of the distribution, you just basically need that uh, uh, schooling is a normal good in order to have uh, richer parents, which are getting richer and richer, whereas poorer parents are not getting as much richer as uh, uh, richer parents are. Uh, you just need that in order to get uh, that richer parents would tend to push kids more if they value education of the children as a normal good. Yeah. It's really the just growth a is dumb kids with rich parents. Yeah, you know, I mean, yeah. That, that's where you're getting the growth. And uh, you can think about it as a normal good. I mean, there's maybe no economic return per se. But there is a greater wealth of those parents from the higher income percentile. That's all. That, I mean, the whole distribution is spread out. So there's a wealth of that. I mean, one of the fallacies, I say recurring fallacies, is somehow using percentiles as measures of absolute wealth. I don't think anybody makes that, or our income in this room makes that fallacy, but it is kind of implicit in a lot of the studies. And in this case, going across the percentiles between 79 and 97, you're getting a much bigger inequality. So just I mean, we looked, with, we looked with, with, you know, look at dollars uh, using sort of uh, uh, some CPI. I mean, it's always tricky. you got to figure out what the right inflation rate, and that could matter a little bit. But uh, it's flatter for the bottom half of the whole bottom half of the distribution. I, mean, I don't know if you have that graph. But anyway, I don't know if I want to bog you down on this, but I, I think that there's a challenge. I mean, I think there is a, I think there's a challenge with the whole, I, I, I the whole Keenan Wolfen story or the Johnson story that, sort of everything comes from parental transfers and that explains the whole relationship. Begs the question is why are parental transfers so different? Why do high income parents want to spend so much on their kids' education and low income parents don't? It's a normal yeah, good. That, it's a normal good, but and remember so the way this is introduced though, Lance, is that you have these conundrums where you seem not to get met so very many credit constraints, right, in, uh, in, in uh, education for children, right, relative to most of literature. But huge borrowing constraints when you get to the consumer durables and consumption over the life cycle. And so somehow people, you know, Cameron and Taylor end up with these kind of you know, schizophrenic or at least bifurcated consumers. They're chasing a very different rate for education than they and that's what a lot of people are doing. One way to think about it is it and the Georgia Hope study too, right? I mean when people gave money to the Georgia Hope kids, there wasn't that much change in education. A huge amount of improvement in the quality of their their consumption, better apartments, bigger cars, and so on. So, so there really does seem to be something where they're put, it's targeted, the parents are paying. I'm not saying it's a whole story, but at least I think it's not to be ruled out. I don't, th yeah. No, that, no but I mean, I, I'm not really any. It's yeah. exactly the point that, that the relative magnitude is not known at this point. Uh, it's qualitatively, I think it's moving yeah. But nobody sorted that out. Yet. No, I agree. Because Keenan right. Wolpin, you don't like that. No, I don't mind it. I, I think well, I mean, it's a very <laughs> strange. Uh, it, it's, I mean, there's a lot of heroic. Uh, yeah, and Johnson, maybe more. Heroic. Johnson, the, well, it's an improvement on data. And, yeah, in terms of data, but the data is much better. Model. But um, I mean, both are pointing thing. towards this notion of the structure. But David, like, they, they, I mean, this. I, I think it's what's, but it's troubling. I mean, I, I mean, I think it just. I, I view it as it knocks the question uh, up a generation, which is why. Then it just sort of begs the question: Why do rich parents spend so much more on their kids' education than poor parents? And that, that, that seems, you know, again, you run into the same conundrum. Is it because they value their kids? Is it a consumption value? Or no, is even, it it's the same, it's exact same problem? Normal, it's just up why down. do rich parents spend more money on Mercedes than on uh, no, I understand. And, and so, I mean, it's a similar kind of thing. I, we're saying it's a luxury good in some sense. And yeah. it's especially a luxury good for a dumb kid. Because it's kind of your ticket. And maybe it's an even way to control the kid. You know, I'm not going to give you money, but I am going to give you an education. And by God, you're going to have to work and earn yourself and not get a transfer. But I don't know. I mean, it, I agree with you. It remains to be determined. Yeah, exactly. I, I actually think that the question mark is, is honest. I mean, it's, it's really, that's a possible explanation which was thought, against like a greater possible thing. I thought the literature, the intergenerational transfer literature, I thought more and more evidence against like pure altruism models and much more in favor of paternalistic models, right? 
targeting transfers to parent to children to get certain ends. I thought that was the thrust. It's not know. a huge I literature. Don't know if that's true. Yeah, I, that yeah, could no, be. Some I of the literature. I mean, I know some, some of the literature says that. Some yeah. of the literature says that. I thought that was the thrust of the li recent literature. There's a handbook on altruism, but that's old. Okay. There's some studies. That I mean, I think uh, what, what the, 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 there's an interesting question, which is, I, I, I'm perfectly fine if you want to uh, explain the whole slope off of that. I guess the, <laughs> the question is, why? What made it increase so much? That I think is a harder, to me, is a harder explanation for why all of a sudden the slope got steeper, if you want to say preferences haven't changed, but now all of a sudden the return to college has gone up a lot. Right. And what makes the rich parents decide to buy them? But for a these guys, like the return to college not. is probably close to zero. What's that? I mean, the, for these guys, the return to so college is probably zero. close to zero, or it's not negative it in all, in both cases. And you still see a great income gradient, as well as you see it here, will probably return very low. Where returns are high, the gradient seems really, really the same. Yeah, we have some estimates. I mean, actually, the returns are negative. Even in your paper, kids. I mean, that's yeah. a different point. No, I agree. That's an interesting point. point. I mean, the top end is, if, if you look at it, I mean, the top end is all these guys are stacking up, and it's mostly showing up in work, I think, at school. Yeah, yeah. that's the other. That's the other result that. Like credit constraints might be important, but they might affect co things that are different in college enrollment. That's like another keen and Wolping finding. Uh, going just because I want to uh, let Rasmus have some time as well. Like the, the second part, and I'll, I'll try to uh, go faster here, is, is that like um, uh, what, what we can see is that like ability is definitely a major determinant of calling attendance. There's no question on that. But because ability is shaped, er, is shaped earlier in life, we might think that constraint experience in earlier period uh, matters a lot because they basically contribute to the formation of these abilities. So these people are not low ability because they have bad genes, but because they actually heard their parents were potentially facing income constraints before. So the studies have gone like in two directions. One is to try to f isolate the causal effect of income uh, through like randomization studies or things of that type, as well as um, analyze more the interaction, which is actually like very recent literature to which Professor Lochner has contributed, the interaction of technology and constraint through structural models. So the first sets of evidence, I, I go back to work with you so you can <laughs> criticize me more, but I'll, what, <laughs> what, what this paper by Dallin Lochner show using the EITC is that a thousand dollar increase in transfers produce a six percent of increase of, there are different numbers, but let's say six percent is the main one of a standard deviation increase in test scores. This is at age between eight and uh, 14, if I remember correctly. And uh, my, th this is, it's not extremely clear to me. I think it depends on the information set that we think the families have. If this change in policy is expected for the family to last for all the years they will be in the ITC, then we might think that the families expect a transfer that is larger than this just $1,000 per year, but is $1,000 per all the periods they will be in the program. So according to how many years the family expects to be in the program, this cost could be potentially, I'd say large. It's, it's like compared to other intervention relatively is relatively large. Even just a 4,000 cost for this effect seems uh, among the high end of the cost that we see in terms of this intervention. The, another paper by Duncan et, uh, and co-authors looks at randomized welfare to work intervention across the US and Canada and finds on earlier, these are earlier test scores in, in ages, but a very similar um, effect of, of a 6% of a standard deviation for a $10,000 increase. There is no clear distinction here. Those programs differ a little bit in uh, what type of income this really means. Like it could be that those people are induced to work more or that these people receive transfer or a combination of the two. And there isn't really uh, an, um, uh, an endogenous modeling of like welfare received or labor supply as well. Here is not like, super easy to do. The, prob the main problem with this study is that actually only two out of the 16 programs that they study show a significant effect. All the others don't show a significant effect. And then they do this a little bit weird uh, statistical thing of pooling everything together and, see, and saying, given that the pooled estimate is not statistically different than the estimate from these two studies, then the overall effect is significant, which uh, seems to me uh, a little bit at odd with uh, <laughs> my statistical model. What are the pooled uh, estimates? They pool everything together and they get an estimate, which is non-significant. Uh, but given that the test of equality between these non-significant pooled estimates and the two significant one reject inequality, then they claim that the two are equal, which it seems to me a very weird thing of doing hypothesis testing. But as another, I, I, I try to summarize here, there are more studies in the table, but another very cited study is this study on casino revenue, which made a, a big mm, 
like fuzz in this literature, which is in this case uh, roughly a 4,000 increase in family income, shows big effect on high school graduation and of probability of being arrested basically while in school, which means, I mean, the two are clearly very correlated. If you stay in school more, you're also more, less likely to commit crime. The problem in these studies, we actually only appear in a footnote, one really needs to study the paper carefully, is that actually the, the, ch the children themselves are eligible to get the bonus from this re casino revenue, those are Indian families, only if they graduate high school, they'll get it at age 18. If they don't graduate high school, they only get it at age 21. So one might think that at least there is a direct effect of this, getting this bonus on the, as a motivation for the children themselves to actually uh, uh, graduate high school. And the crime reduction, there is no crime reduction once the child is older. So it really seems to be uh, more um, consistent with an incapacitation, incapacitation effect due to the fact that they stay in school more. And uh, there are various um, studies on ne negative income tax experiments. Uh, like Mallard in the 70s and then more recent studies by Morris, Genetian and various co-authors. I would say in this case there is a big problem of like income and substitution effects. Obviously negative income tax affect the uh, price of uh, time. Um, uh, but at the same time uh, the effects seems very very mixed. In some studies they seem to show some effects on some outcomes but not on others, on some ages but not on others. I would say there is a there is a failure to show a consistent either positive effect or n no effect. It seems that there is some effect, but it's very, it's very um, uh, mixed. The, the last one is this study by Milligan and Stabile, or however it's pronounced, um, which uh, it's, it's in the source is incorrect in the, in the table. It's actually, they study child benefits program in Canada, which they use like an IV based on some temporal policy variation. The problem with these studies is that they, they talk a long time about how these uh, changes in these welfare transfers interact with other changes in the social policy, especially in Quebec, which is like a more French oriented reason. So there are more even like childcare subsidies or other type of intervention. And when they provide a table where they exclude Quebec, uh, Quebec actually the effects goes completely uh, away. So it really seems that the effect is actually driven by Quebec, which is exactly the province where they have more concern about. Um, there are uh, studies on other interventions which target other aspects of those, of those, um, of this uh, first order condition I was saying. Going from like the one that are the closest to poor income transfer, some that like do provide cash transfer by, but conditional on the parents doing something. Some that try to supplement directly information and knowledge, and some that try to provide investing directly through, for example, having the child go to a center. What we see from these interventions that try to either influence what the parents does with the child or directly provide investment to the children, I think in these there is a lot of uh, literature to which, for example, Professor Ekman has contributed by many other co-authors, Duncan himself, for example, <laughs> is that the effect seems relatively homogeneously uh, strong and seem to like to be robust to testing for evidence on multiple outcomes. So once, even with properly statistical testing from the fact that one is testing multiple outcomes, it seems to sustain the evidence that the effect is stronger. What is lacking and is something that I, I was working on is a study where it's actually, you, it, those studies study, one study test scores, the other study uh, attendance, the other study high school graduation, there isn't really a common benchmark to compare the uh, evidence between the different studies in a, in a common metric. And I think one uh, a, a useful exercise would be to really try to compare the two in terms of magnitude, not only in terms of the presence of an effect or the absence of an effect. And there is very little uh, work on that. The last thing that I want to talk about is this structural estimate of parental credit constraints, which goes a bit with the discussion we were having before, which is, I take this paper, I think is the most um, important in this literature, where they, they, in a model similar to the one that Professor Lagner has presented before, they study the interaction between financial constraint, the timing of the receipt of income, uh, precautionary saving behavior, and child investments. What one seems to find is that uh, between uh, distinguishing between period one and period two, so yeah, younger, old, constraints are stronger for the parents in the e early years of the child life. Constraints are very pervasive in the society. I think 51% in their model of the families appear to be constrained. And these constraints actually seem to increase uh, with, um, it's not really monotonic. It seems that high school dropouts, parents are very constrained, then high, sc co uh, high school graduate parents are less constrained, but then college, uh, some college parents and college graduate parents are even more constrained than high school dropouts. So for example, the highest group 
among constrained uh, parents is college graduates. So there's a problem here, is it, uh, a problem, I don't know, it's, there's a feature which is we might find parents to be constrained, but this might be due because for these parents might be optimal to have a very, very, very high amount of investments. And so we find them indeed constraints, but this doesn't mean that they don't provide enough investments. Indeed, the benefits from the relaxation of constraints really seems to go, especially in the long run, only to benefit children of college graduates. There is basically no effect in the long run, which means the steady states of these uh, overlapping generation model. But, and the effect per, uh, remains only for college graduates. And in the short run, so one uh, generation ahead, the effect is stronger for college graduates' parents, children of college graduate parents, than it is uh, for children of um, less skilled parents. So basically, relaxing credit constraint increases the amount of investment, even if in the new steady state this doesn't change uh, much, the distribution of investments, because parents basically move back to a constrained position. Um, but it doesn't lead to an equalization in investment across families. So the, if anything, the there is even a greater disequalization, if not like an equal amount of differences across different families in terms of investment. And this is the last point I want to make, which is, was uh, raised by Professor Ekman before as well, is that in all this literature, endogenous fertility is ignored. I, I worked on, a, a bit on this, and I see good technical reason why it's ignored. It's very hard to do, especially if one, <laughs> if one starts to consider more than one child. But it's extremely important because we might think that what we really observe are optimal responses to uh, a, con a world in which there are constraints. So we might actually underestimate, it, it depends on how we model the thing. We can either overestimate or underestimate the constraint. If we like, have a model where we exogenously assign a child to the family at a given period, this could lead to an overestimation of the constraint because the, uh, it might be very suboptimal, the period in which the parents have the child, and therefore we find very high constraint. On the other hand, if we, let, if we only observe what happens uh, for, uh, optimally from the parents, then we see, then we see that the, um, a situation in which the parents have responded to these on the margin of the, of the fertility decision, and they are, for example, delaying uh, having a child until they can have enough income uh, to basically not facing constraint anymore. So in this case, constraint might not affect investment, but might affect parental um, utility, for example, because they would have less kids because they started later. So I think it's important to try to incorporate endogenous fertility in those type of models. Have to move to the yes, in fact, I skipped the conclusion. I think we talked a lot about it. Okay, well, um, <clears throat> thank you for having me. So I'm going to start with the same observation as Stefano, basically. And as we've seen on the entire conference, that, that parents' and children's outcomes seem to be very correlated, but also that the correlation in the US tend to be higher than in Scandinavia. Um, and this is an interesting observation because the US is, uh, is differently organized than Scandinavia in terms of, of public sector, in terms of investments in children, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but this also poses somewhat of a problem in comparing the two, uh, the two well, Scandinavia and the US. Um, because the observation that the US and Scandinavia are different and that the correlation is high in the US um, simply because Scandinavia and the US are not the same in, uh, in a lot of different ways is not too informative, I guess. So, uh, so what we will try to do here is take a, a small step further um, and, 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 and take a first step to analyze the mechanisms that actually drive the differences and similarities between the two countries in terms of social mobility. So, so first, what we'll do is we'll, the paper will rest on, uh, on the work on, uh, of the literature on human development and, and skill formation. Uh, and hopefully also contribute to that literature and also to the general literature about social mobility in terms of, uh, of comparing the two countries uh, and comparing a model of skill formation between the two countries. And in doing so, we will uh, also gain additional information on, on, for instance, credit constraints and constraints of educational attainment. So I'm just going to start with showing this figure, as Stefano also showed. Um, so this is, uh, I'm not going to talk too much about it. <laughs> I mean, you all know what it is. Um, so this shows that, that even for, for a level of cognitive skills, there is a, a significant income gradient, which would tend to, uh, to suggest that, 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 um, that, the op uh, that there is inequality of opportunity for a given level of skills. So these two figures show uh, high school completion uh, from the CNLSY data in the US and then from registered data in, the, in Denmark uh, by, by cognitive test scores. So uh, in the US, we have in the CNLSY data, we have peer test scores for math. 
so that's quartiles of that. And within each quartile, there's uh, an income quartile. Um, and then Denmark will have math grades, uh, written math grades from exams. Um, and then within each bundle of grades, we also have income quartiles. So what we see is, well, in terms of income and an income gradient, uh, it's not too different between the two countries. Um, and, and when we turn to college attendance... Can, can you say something real quick about the marginal distributions on the right-hand side so these are comparable? Sorry? So on the left-hand side, you've got quantiles, or sorry, uh, quartiles. On the right-hand side, you've got grade levels, and I would assume most people are in the, uh, you know, the grade inflation BA bucket. So I'm just trying to compare the two graphs. Am I right in thinking that most people are in the far right of the uh, in Denmark? Oh, no, I, I've bundled the grades, so it's, it's, it's roughly 25%. Um, it's not exactly 25%, but uh, so that's... It that is. So 10% of people at the... So 25% of... In that bottom bucket, like really if you take D, E, F, that's half the population, and they only graduate high school with a 30% chance. Yeah. Somebody tell me that's not. <laughs> no. <laughs> really? Is it high school or college? So it's 12 years of completed education. Um, and it's not exactly, it's not 25%. I mean, it, so there is a larger pro proportion in the upper half. But I mean, so what we have is discrete observations. So, so F, E, D, C, B, A. So I can't divide it more, more than that, right? Yeah, yeah, and, no, and that's I, totally I, fine. I just want to know kind yeah. of the numbers. So, so exactly, the, the other is continuous, right? So I can just divide by, um, by, uh, by, by quartiles there, right? Yeah. But, but, but the main point of, of, of the figure is, is not to say that, well, the gradient is, is, this and, and, well, is that high in, uh, in terms of... Um, in terms of grade versus P it scores. It's just basically to show that, that within a given test score or uh, within a given cognitive test scores, there's still an income gradient in both countries. So, so just by comparing these two figures, I guess that, that this says a lot about, or at least it says a lot about what we cannot conclude from the figure, right? Um, well, I don't get it. What are you getting at? So it's just that, that by looking at this figure only, so, so one would tend to, uh, to conclude that, well, within, sev within a given period course, there's an income gradient. So there might be, for instance, like credit constraints to education, to college education, right? Well, but uh, credit constraints work different in, in all the countries. Uh, your credit constraints don't determine where you live. Where you yeah. live determines your school. Yeah. So, I mean, it's just, it all no, no, no. different ways. No, but for instance, mean that just no, because no. Uh, higher education is free, it doesn't mean there are no credit constraints. No, 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 no. no. But I'm sure it doesn't show that there are no credit constraints. But for instance, think of tuition. This could be an argument for saying, well, well, tuition costs are extremely important, right? But when you show the same in a, for a country that, that has no tuition costs, right? No, but then it just means it operates in different ways. Because yeah, yeah. all tuition costs, uh, then that uh, means that we sort it in different neighborhoods, different schools in the high school, which then determine access to higher education. Thank you. That is exactly what we'll investigate. So, um, yeah. So, so that's basically the pitch of it. Yeah. Uh, um, so that's what that's what that's what that's what we will show and discuss. But it's a very equal society. We're talking about the Gatsby curve before, right? Yeah. But it's a very equal society, and it's got very yeah. low tuition. And a lot of the arguments have been made. We're getting a very similar pattern. That's the only observation. Yeah. So, 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 yeah. so, so then how do you what you make of it? You'll see. What's the similar pattern that the ability is important? No, no. That that with within within a, within a cognitive test goals. So within. Uh, it's almost the same people? in terms of income. You, you've got a very yeah. skewed view of. I mean, the whole bottom three quartiles right. are exactly the same in Denmark yeah, and this, oh. across income. That's certainly not true in the U.S. No. Okay. The only observation I want you to take away from this picture is that there is a, there is an income gradient at some point, um, and and then then we'll discuss later, right? So so. So what we'll do is we'll take a very simplified version of the technology of skill formation. So we say that childhood only lasts for one period. So children are born with birth, with birth endowments, theta zero. And then parents are altruistic, invest in their children. Uh, and investments take two dimensions. So they can either invest uh, in nurture on time spent with the child, so time spent doing homework, et cetera. Uh, or they can in invest in terms of schooling, so send the child to private school. Um, and then after observing theta zero, parents choose the levels of investments. So then skills at age 15 and 16, th that involves as a function of, uh, of birth endowments and parental investments. Um, and we consider two skill dimensions, so that's cognitive and uncognitive skills. 
And then schooling outcomes, so high school completion and college attendance, is uh, a function of, of the child's own skill set, and then parental income uh, wealth and, and set of demographic characteristics. And we're going to linearize this, this version completely, uh, which also means that we will not be able to compare anything like complementarity between the two countries. Um, so this is basically just the equations for, for investments, uh, so nature investments, and whether you go to private school. So a linear function of birth endowments and, and parental resources. Uh, and likewise for, for the skill formation, so for each uh, set of skills, so cognitive and non-cognitive skills, a function, a linear function of birth endowments and then investments. And finally also the same for, for high school and, uh, and college, high school completion and college attendance. Um, okay, so importantly what we'll do is we'll anchor the mo model in, uh, in high school completion for both countries uh, in order to find something where we can actually compare the scales. So, so this anchoring will, uh, the problem is that, that the way we estimate cognitive and non-cognitive skills uh, is actually a factor that has no natural scale. So even though we, we normalize something within the measurement system, which actually allows us to identify it, then, then I mean, it will still not be meaningful com to compare between countries. So we'll anchor it as, at the same outcome, and that will give us an interpretable scale, at least interpretable and meaningful to the extent that, that high school completion is the same between the two countries. Is, um, that, is there a reason you guys can't anchor to earnings? Yeah. I mean, would, would you prefer that if you could or not? Because I mean, you want to talk about marginal returns and such, then so earnings is a nice metric. You just don't have the, are you, you don't have the data to do no, that? No, no, we don't have the data. So, so I mean, for seamless white children, for us to have earnings data would mean that we would have to take everyone born in, in early 80s, and that would be, I mean, a highly skewed sample. And we need also grades for Denmark, so yeah. Um, okay. So as I said, we use CNLSY data for the US. Um, so we need to observe at least uh, one test score for each skill um, and uh, one measure of investments. Um, and then, oh, God, OK. Um, so, so we live with the sample <laughs> to some extent, uh, similar by, uh, but we also need to observe them entering college, or at least allow them the opportunity to enter college. Uh, and for Denmark, we use the, the cohort, entire cohort of children born in 1987. Uh, so register and administer datas, data, and then we also use a uh, survey much comparable to the CNLSY, uh, which will link to register data, and we get um, information on parental investments there. Um, I am just gonna. <laughs> so um, I'm sorry. I mean, um, yeah, but I'm short on time. Uh, so we use birth endowments. Uh, we measure birth endowments by uh, by basically birth characteristics. So that is birth width, gestational length, and and length of the child. Uh, cognitive measures, we use the period scores uh, from the CNLS Y, and we use exam grades from math and science in Denmark. Uh, so the non-cognitive measures, that's, that's I guess where the largest difference is. So for the US, we use BPI scores. Thank you. <laughs> that was very generous. Uh, 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 and use this free, the three sub scores. And, uh, and for Denmark, we use, uh, we use exam grades, but but a different type of exam grades uh, on, on something called organization and neatness. I don't know the proper translation. Um, so for nurture investments uh, at age 10 to 13, so this will not be early childhood investments. This will be, I guess, early adolescent investments. Um, we use questions relating to time spent helping the child with homework, time spent reading for or with the child, or time spent playing with the child. And importantly, this will be the same questions in, in both uh, countries. Uh, and investments uh, by a private schooling will be measured also at ages 10 to 30. What does that mean in Denmark? Sorry? What does that even mean in Denmark, private school? Well, yeah, I mean, so all again. So religious nutcase schools. I mean, there's no, there's no high quality <laughs> private school. Oh, the, uh, there are, but it's a very, very, no, it's very, very low percent of That's a difficult strength. I mean, constraints on, uh, on private investments yeah. so in Denmark. Yeah. But again, yeah, so private schools mean something different. And, and we'll see in the results that that, that that reflects, I mean, that private schools are something completely different. First of all, yeah, because there are not so many of them. I mean, they do exist. And it's not only religious nutcases that, that go to private schools. So many of the religious schools are actually high quality schools and ma many non-religious parents send their children there. Um, and it's not, I mean, by saying many, I don't mean like 50%. But the average rate of private school uh, use in Denmark is, in, for these ages, 10%. And today, it's, it's actually 15%. Um, and, and well, if you call, 
So 15% so of Denmark is reduced nut cases. That might be the case. I don't know. But um, yeah. Um, OK, this just. So this basically just shows uh, high school completion by, uh, by percentiles of uh, parental income um, in the CNLS Y sample and then in the Danish register data. So, uh, so again, what we see here is that, that if we go from, from the bottom to the top of, of the distribution, um, the increase is somewhat similar, right? It's, it's around a, a 30, 25 to 30 percentage points increase, while the shape uh, is, well, differs extremely, right? So to the left, we have more of a concave shape, shape while to the right, we have <coughs> um, a convex shape which is, I guess, very similar to the one that, that Shell showed us earlier. Um, when we consider colors attendance in the, the CMOS Y sample, um, what we see is actually, again, a, a concave shape, uh, much sharper this time. While for the, for the Danish sample, we also see that this, there is this sharp uh, convexity, except perhaps for, for the lowest part of parental income. Where, I mean, it could, could look like it is sort of S-shape S in the same way that we also saw for Norway. Um, but this is again, this is parental household income or wage earnings. Um, so, I mean, that might shift people around uh, a bit and that might also distort the sort of clear S shape that we saw for Norway. Um, so we con when you consider uh, high school completion by parental income and wealth, uh, similar to this plotted, um, so we have parental wealth percentiles to the left and parental income percentiles to the right. Um, what we see here is that that the gradient for the U.S. is mainly driven by uh, by wealth, while in Denmark it's it's both driven by by wealth and, and income. Um, while when we s consider college, so college uh, attendance in percent on the uh, on the c-axis, and then parental wealth and income on the baselines, um, we also see sharp gradients in both income and wealth in both countries. But in Denmark, it tends to flatten out uh, for the low income wealth combination, uh, while it seems to just basically go further down in the US sample here. Um, okay. So this is basically what we find when we consider high school completion by parental income and wealth, conditional on cognitive and non-cognitive skills and, and um, observable characteristics X. So what we see is that the gradient is basically gone. So that there, I mean, there's a very, very low gradient in parental income, uh, or non-existent gradient in parental income, uh, and there is a little in parental wealth. And it's basically the same for Denmark. So it's almost mechanical. But it's not almost mechanical. I mean, I mission to college in Norway, and Denmark depends on, on GPA. No, it doesn't. It's complete. So this is high school. This okay. is completely, I mean, everyone could go to high school. There's, there's no. And college? No, that, that, I mean, whether you can always go to a college without a high GPA score. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, college attendance in Denmark, I mean, it is a sequential decision, so you need to have attended some form of high school to enter college, but you will always be able to find a college. I mean, there are, there are a lot of, lot of educations without any GPA demands. I mean, when I started economics, um, there were so few that wanted to be economists that, that basically the only thing that was demanded was, was a high school graduation. So, yeah. Um, and you're saying if you could get a degree, anybody could not come. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> ex ex exactly. Um, no. So. Uh, so the main please tell, can you please tell, I, I can, what are the, the magnitudes here? What is the minimum or maximum of this curve? So here? Yeah. So this is around 75, and this is around 82. And, uh, uh, and here, it, this, is around, this is around 60, and this is around 70, a little less than 70. So, so if you go to the top, from the top of the income wealth distribution is conditional on skills and demographic characteristics. The, the difference seems to be similar in both countries. Um, so when we consider high school completion by cognitive and non-cognitive skills, and back to your comment, Mark, because there are, no, uh, there are no entrance demands to high school in Denmark. Everybody can go in. You can even get, get in high school without have completing uh, <laughs> compulsory schooling. Um, if you dropped off compulsory schooling and then find out that you want to do high school anyway, you can do that. But but to the right in Denmark, that relationship seems, seems to be almost, almost de deterministic in any way. So that f for high-skilled students, so those for, with the highest level of skills, um, everybody go to high school. While those with the lowest level of skills, nobody goes to high school. In the US, it's not so clear-cut. 
uh, again, everybody with the highest level of skills goes to high school, while uh, with the lowest level of skills, still uh, a sizable proportion, one and a half goes to high school. So this shows college attendance by parental income and wealth in the same way I just showed with high school before. Um, and again, the, the picture is basically the same, that, that when we consider the top, top uh, wealth income combination and the bottom wealth income combination, conditional on skills and demographic characteristics, it seems to be the same, the same difference, right? Or roughly the same difference. Um, and also, when we consider college attendance by cognitive and non-cognitive skills, conditional on, on income and wealth, again, uh, the gradients seem to be very, very similar. So, um, so there are large increases in the probability of going to college in non-cognitive skills uh, and also in cognitive skills uh, in both countries. And again, the magnitude, if you go from from uh, from the top of the distributions to the bottom of the, the, the distribution seem to be somewhat similar. Okay, so that was education uh, and sort of the end game of, of our analysis. So let's just start from the beginning. So this shows birth endowments uh, by, sorry, not by mother's education, only by parental income. Five, okay. Um, so what we see here is that, oh, sorry, that's 95% uh, confidence intervals. Um, so what we see is, first of all, that, uh, that there is a significant gradient in parental income in terms of birth endowments. So that's, that's I mean, sort of your initial set of skills um, in both countries when you... Uh, but again, uh, this, these differences in shapes seem to... Uh, uh, s uh, seem to manifest. And this could either be because that the, the distribution of, of income uh, differs and that somehow forces this relationship to be true, but it could also hint that there's something about about how uh, how the two countries differ in terms of, terms of um, for instance, public investments that sort of puts a flaw to uh, to this relationship in in Denmark. So again, we see that it's highly convex in uh, in Denmark and concave in the U.S. But that there are significant gaps at birth in both countries. Um, so, if I only have five minutes, then. Um, well, I'm going to just say that uh, I'm going to turn to um, only look in Denmark. So, so what we do now is we we um, we say, well, how are the av average skill levels of your peers in uh, in your day or in your preschool institution and in your in your school? So, so this figure shows the mean level of birth endowments for your peers in your preschool at age five by parental income wealth, uh, levels. And this is actually going back to, to the talk from yesterday about, um, about how people sold into different neighborhoods uh, depending on, on income, right? So even in preschool, we see that there's a significant increase in, um, in birth endowments um, across uh, parental, um, parental income. So, so the y-axis is again anchored to uh, to probability of high school atten attendance. So, uh, so in, in magnitude, in terms of of, of high school completion, um, it doesn't seem that much, but 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 in any case, it's significant. So, so actually, your peers in in your preschool in Denmark, their initial set of skills would be different if you come to a preschool where it's only made up of or if your parents are, are very wealthy and you come to a preschool that's predominantly uh, populated by wealthy children relative to, um, to poor children. Um, and, and, yeah, so, and, th and this, is, this is all public preschools, right? So this is, I mean, this is just sorting in neighborhoods that shows this. So it's basically the same when we consider cognitive skills at age 15 in public schools. Um, so that the average mean levels of, of your peers uh, increase significantly. Um, and this shows that, that even though we have this, this very, very large public sector with very, very large levels of public investments, I mean, parental income can, can find a different way, right, to, um, to or, uh, sorry, high income parents can find a different way to invest in their children. They can just sort in neighborhoods which are high skilled, right? And this might even, even I mean, this might either be because that people sold and then schools have no effect. It might be because, yeah, schools are better uh, in high income neighborhoods and it might be, well, because of peer effects. I mean, who knows? Um, yeah. And that's basically the, I mean, I ran out of time, so.
Yeah. Well, thank you.